Yes, you do. So let's listen to the third uh, presentation by Thanasis Yorgiakopoulos today uh, on semantic maps. I, I see your see this thing. Um, okay, that's not a problem, but I can say it's fine. Yeah. Okay, is that okay now? Yeah, better. And uh, yeah, and the sound, I hope, works well. Uh, okay. It should be now. It should be okay. Oh, Can everybody yeah. hear uh, Thanasis properly? Yes. Yeah, okay. No, Thank you for black bar over there. Uh, no, 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 black one, the black one. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Okay. If you want, right. and the How can I do that? and okay. move the other one on your name. Mm. Uh, put it somewhere. Mm. So, uh, can yeah. I move my place? I don't know. I, mean, I can just. This is not a problem here, right? No, no, it's okay. Right. Okay. okay. Let's get started. Right. Right. Okay, Have you got your loudspeaker on? Mm -hmm. uh, and you can still hear me. Oh, yes, I can hear you, and I hope that everybody can hear us. Okay. Right. Okay. So, so, now I can hear my voice twice again. Okay. What about now? Last test. Can everybody hear us? Test one. Because test we, we just switched off something. We don't know. <laughs> uh, we, okay, c'est bon. Oh, great. So welcome so, to this uh, third uh, seminar, uh, which can be seen as a logical continuation of the first two seminars on uh, networks, uh, semantic maps. Uh, today, I will be presenting two case studies, one for diachrony and one for uh, typology. So, and I will be discussing macro area uh, uh, and universal uh, patterns. So my title is Quantum Approaches to Semantic Change and to Aerial Linguistic uh, Typology. Um, uh, all right, so today, first I will start with a brief Overview of what we did last time, especially regarding automatic plotting. Automatic plotting. And then I will uh, focus on these two key studies on uh, lexical diachronic semantic maps, with a special focus on uh, the domain of time. So uh, the focus will be on time related lexemes. And the second key study uh, will be about uh, macro area and universal patterns with a special focus on the domains of perception and cognition. So the main goal of today's talk is to show that network visualizations are not just a convenient way of displaying the results, but support the in-depth diachronic and methodological analysis in an instrumental and meaningful uh, way. So let's uh, remember what we discussed the other time about automatic, automatic plotting. And um, remember that we uh, refer to this uh, similar paper by Regier, Ketarbo, and Magie, who show that the approximation produced by the algorithm proposed uh, by Andrew and colleagues are of high quality, which means that they produce equal or better results than the manually plotted maps. So the, the problem was up until that point, the, the, the main criticism against connectivity that is semantic maps, uh, was that uh, they work fine uh, when we have few data, but uh, uh, when it comes to last data sets, it is almost impossible to produce uh, a result. Uh, so Regio and uh, colleagues addressed this uh, challenge and they solved uh, this uh, problem in this uh, the paper. Um, so they tested the, the algorithm on the cross linguistic data of uh, Hasselhoff 1997, uh, which focused on the independent pronouns, functions um, like a specific known, specific unknown, uh, and, and so on. Um, and uh, let's now see the logic of how this algorithm works. And 
remember that we are dealing with uh, graphs, which means that we have nodes and edges, edges that is connect the lines, and uh, nodes in our uh, case here represent meanings. So we have different meanings. And we also have a set of constraints uh, which are linguistic patterns of uh, expressions. So in this case, um, on the right hand, um, we have uh, this constraint here. So all these the constraints are represented by uh, these dark lines. So there's one constraint here, another one here, and another one here. So these are the three constraints. And uh, one connects the nodes using yes. economically based on these constraints. Um, so let's assume that we have these um, matrix here with uh, four different meanings and uh, five different uh, forms. And one here represents um, uh, the uh, presence of uh, a meaning and uh, zero the absence of a meaning for a certain form. Okay. Um, so the goal is to find the minimum number of edges between the nodes such that each pattern of expression will pick out a connected region of the graph, which is a way to replace the joint connectivity hypothesis and economy principle. And by economy principle, uh, we specifically mean this one. So we take uh, these uh, th three different minutes in uh, A, and B, and B, and C. So given yep. these things, if the linguistic items expressing meaning A and meaning C, and always express meaning B, there is no need to draw an edge between meaning A and meaning C. That's why I crop uh, this edge here between A and C. And I'm mentioning this because the algorithm, in a way, takes into account of this aspect. Um, so the algorithm specifically considers the utility scores of the edges, that is the number of constraints that the edges satisfy when they are added to the graph. And in this uh, example here that I said before, you see again the right um, uh, here. Um, so if we add this edge here, I'll show you right now. Uh, 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 the, number, the number of uh, uh, constraints that this head satisfies is, is two. two. Because, because if I add this, uh, uh, I make happy with this, this constraint here and, and that constraint that. here. Um, so if you deal with the score of uh, this uh, now edge is uh, two. two. Um, now as for the edge uh, A and B, the utility score is three. Why? Because it appears in three different forms, one, three, four, which means that it satisfies three constraints. Okay? It, 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 what that is, it appears in three different um, co-expression patterns. You see that meaning A, meaning B, is part of the co-expression pattern meaning A, a meaning B. Um, the uh, edge here, uh, A and B, connecting A and B, is, is also part of the expression pattern that includes A and B, but also D. Uh, and so th this is the whole constraint, uh, A, B, and D. And uh, it also satisfies the constraint uh, in, four, in form four, as you see here, again, the constraint is A and B. So the utility score is three here for this edge, for this particular edge, because it satisfies three uh, constraints. Um, as for the edge B and C, the utility score is two. Uh, as for B and D, uh, the edge connecting nodes B and D, the utility score is two. And as for the edge uh, C, D, the utility score is one. Uh, same for uh, a and D. All right, so we have a table here with the edges uh, and the utility score for each edge. Uh, and, and the algorithm, what does the algorithm do? It starts with the edges that have the highest utility score. That is, that my algorithm, our algorithm, will start connecting first the edge uh, that connects A and B. So this is what we see here. Then it will move on with edges 
BC and BD, right? Because this is the next uh, in the ranking. And then, okay, sorry, yes. And then the, the other one will stop here because the graph is minimally connected and accounts for all of the expression patterns of the table, all right? And so th this means that uh, one might wonder why don't we connect C and D, mean C uh, with mean D? And the answer would be because seeing this figure, um, I infer that when I have C and D, I always have mean B. And let's uh, have a look at the table to see whether this is true. So when I have C and D, okay, like in uh, say, like in uh, uh, five, uh, I also have mean I B. I also have mean B. Okay, that's okay, so nice. nice. Same with, same with mean, mean D, D and mean A. A. Why, don't Why don't I connect, I connect mean A, A to, to mean D? D? Because the assumption is that when I have mean D and mean A, I should also have mean B. So let's uh, check for A and D. A and D and D. This is in form yes. of three. When I have uh, A and D, I also have B. So that's correct. That's, so that's why my uh, algorithm stops. Uh, the algorithm by regular at uh, R, I mean, uh, stops stop there. there. Has uh, it got a name? The, the fact that you, we're trying to be economical or something. So it's. Is it called cool. economical network? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's based, based on, on this economy principle. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. So but the but the it's a manic mass, 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 mass uh, by, by definition, depends uh, uh, on the economic principle. Economic okay. Despite the fact that this was, was not um, um, expressed, expressed as such, as such the very, very first combination of the hypothesis and the collectivity of the Yes. Yes. What your microphone, maybe if microphone. have your microphone on if you want. If... On your you Zoom? No, okay. Uh, what about if you have several semantic map that are uh, just as a good and uh, like how do you choose one rather than another? Ah, okay. Yeah. Um, Repeat the question. Yes, yeah, so the question is what happens uh, when uh, and if uh, the algorithm. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. If uh, there, are, there are more than one economic uh, mass, um, I mean, as in the case uh, here, yeah. you see here, for example, uh, when you have like a between score two, then it will add at the same time all these edges. So it's, it's not so like I start with B and C first and B and D, and then it, you might end up with uh, two or three maps. That's true. Which will account for all polysemic patterns in the end. Uh, but yes, this could be the case. This is not a case here, um, but it could be, yes. Um, so, yes, now you see, so, um, this is the map that has been produced manually, right? And um, let's see what's the result uh, if we use uh, uh, electronics. Um, um, so no, they, they take, take this, this mixed matrix, matrix as, as input, input with a language, language uh, a a column, column, uh, uh, and forms the second column in different meanings with, with one representing uh, uh, absence uh, or, or presence of a meaning. Input, then they run the algorithm, the result is the one to see, um, um, which, which in a way reproduces the map, the map that we uh, uh, so show in half, but with one slight difference. <laughs> in the algorithm, algorithm we did not use a network between the reality and the traditional, um, uh, because it uh, uh, didn't. Um, this, this was like a redundant test according to the regular value. So this is the only slight difference. Um, um, so you know you can compare the two, two again, again the same, same result, result right? right? Exactly. Same result, result. If you, you exclude this here, and, and now, now we have the information is in the score. The score for the education position is 64. That is, that appears in 64 patterns, right? 64 forms have this polysemy. Uh, uh, 49 question in identification, 46 in the answer specific, and so on. Let's see how we build um, the, the, the map, right? So we will start with question conditional, this set, because this has the highest High score. score. So, so we add question, uh, uh, so question conditional. 
right? So she is for how much value we now did. Then we add question invariant negation because this is a second. Then we add it as a specific question because this is the third. Indirect negation comparative, indirect negation, direct negation, specific and only random specific. You see the specific, the, um, you take this code, right? Specific and only specific and only. No, no. Next, the right right. Right. So uh, for a special order, the specific yes, yes. order you're doing it from based on the TC score yes. of each edge. Yes. 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 Of each edge, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Comparative, Comparative with choice, choice. Yeah. Yeah. Then, then conditional, conditional value, value. and, that, and that, that's, that's it. it. So that's, so that's uh, yeah. the result. And you see that the, the algorithm mm -hmm. did mm -hmm. not uh, uh, produce the measure in the answer specific uh, condition. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the, the, the input, input was a matrix of ones and zeros, yes. which you showed us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here, yeah. 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 the languages, languages, the world forms. Huh? This is exactly just just not not right. right? This is not the whole uh, uh, table. Uh, you can only see the German, the Dutch, and the English words, and the different functions with ones and zeros, right? Okay. And so, um, uh, also, uh, recall that uh, said that we can add an additional layer uh, uh, in our map. That is, we can include information about the frequency of collision patterns. Uh, we can use weighted uh, maps for this. Uh, so we adjusted um, in a 2021 paper uh, I co-authored with uh, Stefan Police uh, the algorithm by regular time. Uh, in order to take into account the frequency of attestation. So uh, the more expression, collection pattern is attested, the, um, the more weight uh, is added uh, to uh, our edge. And this is how the map will look like if you add the weights. So you take the information here that the conditional question, for example, is much more frequent uh, than Iriel's uh, non-specific question. In a way, we add the utility scores on uh, the edge. And, and you can also uh, add uh, more information if you like, uh, for example, um, communities. Uh, com uh, uh, here, so we, we run this modularity analysis, which detects automatically uh, communities within uh, your graph. Uh, the, the, uh, when we ran the algorithm, it detected three uh, communities, three clusters, the one uh, uh, with the orange, the one with uh, the green, and the one with uh, the, the purple. All right, so that was a very um, long overview, but with a slight difference in order to make some things more uh, comprehensible. Uh, remember to, that uh, today's uh, talk, and the main goal is to show that network visualizations are not just a convenient way of displaying the results, but uh, supporting the diachronic and epilogical analysis in a meaningful way. Uh, so the first case study is on lexical diachronic semantic maps, uh, which is, uh, this part is based on uh, a joint uh, work with uh, Stefan Police uh, from the University of Liège when I spent my time back in 2018 there, and actually two years. Um, so now we remember from the, the first uh, seminar, uh, we, uh, we talked about the scope of the semantic maps method. Um, uh, we have many studies focusing on uh, the grammatical domain and the asynchronic, uh, like you see here, a list of uh, ed, um, uh, topics that have been discussed in the literature. So on additives, temporal markers, conditionals, coordination, core arguments, and so on. We have um, since 2008 and uh, the paper by Alex Francois, uh, there are uh, some studies on uh, the lexical domain, but still synchronic. There are a few diachronic studies focused on the, the grammar and there are less uh, studies focusing uh, on the lexicon that deal with the diachrony. And uh, uh, you see now two of the studies uh, that deal with, uh, with uh, uh, diachrony in the lexicon. And uh, Alex, uh, in his 2022 paper, discusses lexical diachronic uh, uh, maps 
And you can see one example here, showcasing um, a change uh, in the time as, uh, in, uh, at the level of uh, semantics. Uh, here we have uh, terms for upper leaves in northern Vanuatu, and we see the phenomenon of lexical merger. Uh, to uh, protoforms bunny and uh, lima, okay, and uh, with uh, different meanings, wing, arm, and hand, and uh, we have these uh, uh, patterns in proto oceanic and in uh, eight uh, conservative languages, and uh, uh, we, uh, what you see in stage two actually is not a different uh, diachronic states if you compare these to the eight languages, but they are more. Uh, not that conservative uh, language language varieties. Uh, we see that uh, uh, the uh, reflex, the reflexes of Lima have been lost, and uh, wing, arm, hand are all expressed by the, the form of body. And this is a way how one can uh, visualize uh, the result of thematic change in a nice um, map. Um, so this, by the way, we can do like a, another tangent here. So this paper of Alex appears in our special issue, which was published um, by last year by Charles with uh, It uh, includes new avenues and challenges in semantic research. Uh, research. It's open access. You can uh, have a look at it and uh, read all the interesting articles. Uh, so. Let's now see what to, we did in our work with Stefan on lexodiachronic semantic maps. So we uh, designed a special protocol for constructing a lexical uh, diachronic semantic map. You see the abbreviation here stands for lexical diachronic semantic maps. And you see the various steps of, of this protocol. You first have to choose your concepts. Then you identify cross-linguistic policy patterns, connectification patterns, policy patterns, whatever. Uh, we convert the policy patterns into a lexical matrix. We plot a weighted semantic map that takes into account uh, the frequency uh, of collection patterns in the language of the world. Then we remove infrequent policy patterns, a step which is not that important, but we do this for specific reasons. We will discuss these uh, later on. And this part is the synchronic uh, a part of the protocol. And the second part uh, goes uh, as follows. We select the language with diachronic data. We then ensure comparability. We add the diachronic information, and then we visualize uh, the result. So it consists of both a synchronic and diachronic part. And that's also important because uh, we want our map to have a synchronic typological validity, not just be uh, a diachronic uh, map. Um, so the first step is to choose the concepts for the purpose of universality and stability. We chose uh, the temporal concepts that appear in uh, the Schroeder's 200 word list. Uh, these are the concepts day, night, and year. And then the goal is to identify the cross linguistic policy patterns. For this reason, uh, we resorted to uh, clicks, a database of cross linguistic collectifications. Uh, at that point, uh, only the second version was available. So we used uh, this version, although now there's a third one, which includes more concepts and more language varieties. And um, the number of concepts linked to our three concepts uh, uh, is 30. So the number of concepts in clicks linked to our th three concepts a day, year, and night is 30. Um, and you see here uh, the original list from Sodas, day, night, and year. Um, you also see in this column here that uh, in clicks, uh, day, not night, day, 24 hours uh, correspond to day, day, time in Sodas list. Okay, night and here are the same. And the, the different concepts um, related to these three um, original concepts, for example, clock, God, heaven, hour, season, this amounts to 11, 14 for night, uh, five for year. Uh, so uh, there are forms that co-express year and age, 
year in autumn, year in springtime, year in, in, in summer. That's what we mean here. And you can see the, uh, the visualization that appears in clicks in this platform for a day, not night, okay? um, with the different concepts. Uh, this should be how many? Uh, 11, okay? with 11 concepts. <clears throat> now, um, all the classification patterns are tested for these 30 concepts were gathered from the clicks source files which may be found in uh, GitHub. Um, this gives us 21,000 individual word forms that have, at that have at least one of these meanings. And uh, out of these, uh, 2,800 uh, 2, items express more than one meaning. Uh, so this is uh, the data uh, as a, uh, appears in the file that you one downloads. And you have the, the form here, uh, the numbers represent tones, as uh, Alex mentioned the other time, right? And um, in central Thai, air and weather are collectified, as you may see here. So this is how one uh, looks at the data uh, in clicks. And what we did is that we convert um, these patterns that we saw in the previous in this table here into a lexical matrix of this type. So. In order to, uh, so that we are able to use uh, the regular, uh, regular and tally algorithms. We have the languages here in one column, uh, the forms and the different meanings. So this is again an extract, right? Um, and so we run the, the algorithm and we run the adjusted algorithm, but it takes into account the weights. And this is the result. Uh, so this is a semantic map of time-related concepts visualized with the modularity analysis in the program GEFI that we uh, discussed and we saw last time. Uh, you see also information here, weight plus two. This means that we excluded patterns that are tested in just one uh, language. And um, in fact, 430 edges are supported by classification patterns occurring in more than one language variety. So if you want, if one counts all these edges, the uh, total will be 430. And now uh, we start uh, removing uh, the infrequent policing patterns. So this is the map now with weight plus four, that is we have at least four, four um, language varieties expressing uh, this uh, classification pattern. And um, you know, when we, we did this, we um, one can observe that there are three uh, different clusters, one for day um, and, and maybe also year, yes, this one, uh, the other one with the night, black, and so on, and the other one with the late, uh, slow, after, and, and so on, okay? Um, one could also say that there is a distinct one with a, a year alone. Um, so we decided to focus on this uh, large cluster. We wanted to, in a way, delineate our topic because it's uh, very difficult uh, to conduct a diachronic analysis uh, manually because the diachronic part is uh, manually uh, done uh, if you have so many concepts. So, uh, this step of re for removing the frequent policy patterns has the, this uh, logic. Um, and then we um, try to delineate it even further. Uh, we set the threshold uh, in uh, 12. Okay? And this is the, uh, the result, the ending um, semantic map that we use in order to uh, Add directionality. So you see that we have concepts like age, year, summer, sun, sky, cloud, heaven, and so on. This will be uh, the focus. We will um, zoom in uh, these concepts and we will try to add, if possible, directionalities from one node to another, or maybe add other nodes if uh, that's possible. I will show in such a case later on. Um, 
the, so, the idea of raising the threshold yes. is uh, is also mostly for practical purposes. You would yes. say you have mm -hmm. instead of having like mm -hmm. thirty five concepts to deal with, you have. Uh, I mean, one might uh, yeah. uh, <laughs> conduct the chronic analysis using this huge map. So that's. Uh, I mean, it takes more can, time. And, uh, it takes more time. Yes, I mean, uh, in the, if one finds the way to do that automatically, if uh, we have the right resources and so on, I mean, the, ideally you should use this one. Yeah. But we have to, uh, you know. So it's like a filtering of yes. uh, concepts, retaining only the concepts with most uh, collectification. Yes, things. because this yeah. increases the chances. That we will find um, a, a, a semantic change in the languages that we use. I mean, of course, this might not be the case, mm -hmm. but we have to apply a certain criteria there. Okay. And you may see the reason why uh, in the very next slide. So we move on, on to the diachronic part, and on to the very first the, <laughs> after this. And so this, the next step is to select languages with diachronic data, our focus. It was on ancient Greek and ancient Egyptian, uh, three different diachronic stages for uh, each language. We use uh, corpora, uh, several lexical resources to cross check our uh, data and so on. And now um, we, for, for the sake of uh, comparability, uh, we use the definitions provided by con the Concepticon and other resource. Um, and um, why did we use these definitions? Uh, for example, you see the definitions for age, day, and sun here, because uh, um, we, we wanted to look for the lexical items in ancient Egyptian and ancient Greek that mean age, but or day or sun, but we wanted to make sure that we are using the same definition. So that's the logic behind uh, us resorting to uh, uh, this uh, meta resource. Um, <clears throat> So yeah, that's actually the, the real problem. Uh, since we have to proceed on a machine logically, um, which means that we have to take into account all the lexemes that express in a particular language, that express a certain uh, meaning. So we have to take uh, uh, the lexeme, lexeme uh, iliki, iliki, right? That means age, uh, emma and eos, uh, that mean, a day, daytime, it's in Greek, values that mean sun, and so on. And, and this now, and you see also the uh, different lexemes in ancient Egyptian, and this is a very time consuming uh, task. Okay? If, uh, we don't have um, a thesaurus okay, that would ease this process. And uh, something like that exists, for example, in, uh, for, for English, uh, but it does not exist for uh, uh, ancient Greek. So we need to uh, consult several resources in order, in order to, to be able to extract uh, the right information. All these words that mean this concept. Uh, so that is uh, also a reason why we uh, restricted uh, uh, the, uh, the number of collective cases and patterns that we uh, took into account. Um, after the analogical step, we proceeded similarly. So the list we just saw is the list of words, or it's just a sample? No, that's a sample. That's, that means there's a huge How many table. words were you when you go like 20, 40 mm, or uh, 34 I think, each language? Right? I think you know, approximately 50. Uh -huh. uh, only for this domain, only. From Homeric Greek, for the Greek. Uh, Homeric Greek, uh, classical Greek, and uh, Hellenistic uh, Koine. Koine. Yeah. There's a question. No. Okay. no, no. Uh, and and the diachronic side of it is not about etymology or something. It's it's about uh, the sources, the philological sources we have from, on the long history of Egyptian and, and of exactly. Greek. So yeah, the starting point is Homeric Greek. Uh, so if you have uh, uh, two meanings attested in Homeric Greek, uh, we do not consider this as you know uh, a diachronic classification. Uh, the uh, historical priority of, of one sense over the other is the first criteria. So uh, one sense should appear, uh, as you see here in the table, uh, at the first diachronic stage, so in early, early Egyptian or this uh, lexim now. now. Um, you see that this expresses the meaning uh, moment, and not only at the second diachronic stage 
we see the extension to moment in time. Uh, in Coptic, it comes to express day and night and, and hour. And of course, there are, as you may assume, that there are some limitations. Uh, this approach cannot account for a loss of meaning. Um, so the only thing that you can visualize here, of course, there, there might be some ways to visualize loss of meaning, but as, I mean, I don't know how, you may add an edge with a certain transparency or whatever, and this will indicate that, uh, and I don't know, that you you, you miss a, a node or something. But uh, as is right now, there's no way to uh, represent loss of meaning. And this is also this is also reflected in the way this table is structured. You see, Homeric Greek gain uh, in classical Greek we gain in the Hellenistic era Roman. But the table could represent easily loss. We will have one initial at some early stage. You will have a one, and then it becomes a zero. Um, principle, and then it's mm -hmm. what you say is about the graph. Yes, of course, yes. The, uh, I mean, it's difficult to uh, to represent graphically a uh, uh, loss of meaning. Okay. Um, then, as I mentioned, uh, in order to add a direct edge, uh, we have to take into account historical priority of one meaning over the other. And we added a second uh, criteria to make it more difficult. Uh, there should be a clear semantic motivation. Historical priority, we say it's not enough. Uh, we shall be able to detect a mechanism that we think that connects uh, one meaning with the other. And you see now the list of semantic extensions that we uh, detected and the mechanism in the second column and uh, the languages that, that uh, a certain direct directionality is attested. Um, as you may observe here, um, most associations can be attributed to a metonymy, uh, which is the result of uh, the data that exists in uh, clicks, actually. And now- Do you um, have cases of a reverse? Like if you could just come back? Uh, like for instance, I see summer towards harvest, uh, which is shared by Egyptian and Greek. Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. sometimes you have a case where mm -hmm. you have you know, summer to harvest, mm -hmm. and then another word that means harvest becomes summer. Mm -hmm. or is it always unique? Uh, here you see uh, all the attested directionalities that we identified in our corpus. This does not mean that you cannot find uh, the reverse pattern. You oh, may I find see one. time uh, to season and season to time. Okay, yes. Okay. Uh, then, yeah. And, and yeah. time, our, our time. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And actually, um, this is predicted by the metonymic nature of this association. Because uh, metonymies uh, are by definition bi directional. Um, wow. Yes, yeah, uh, of course. I mean, you have a, a part for whole and whole for part. Uh, so it's not that you, you always go from part whole or from whole to part, right? Mm -hmm. So metonymies are, by definition, uh, bi directional. So this is something that you expect. Yeah. You did not expect to find uh, bi directionalities in, in metaphors, right? So uh, as you check, for example, springtime and youth extension, mm -hmm. uh, we can predict that there should not be a language that we have um, and, and, and a form that expresses first youth and then we have an extension to springtime. Um, of course, even for uh, metaphors and for conceptual metaphors, uh, there have been studies that show that bidirectionalities are also possible in a very um, a uh, specific way, but this is not part of our, mm -hmm. uh, you know, talk today. Um, so, but, but since you mentioned that, um, also the challenge is, okay, we say that uh, metonymies are bi-directional. Bi the challenge is to uh, see uh, if we see bi-directionalities. You see, you said uh, season time and time and season. What's more frequent when it comes to directionality? So if you consider, um, more diachronic data, like for, from 20 languages. And you do find um, uh, the extension from uh, season to time, two times, and 18 times from uh, time to season. So this might uh, say something. So even in the case of metonymies, if we find differences in frequency, this might be revealing as well. So this is why it's also um, very important to consider uh, weighted maps also for directionality. So in order to visualize the result, we used uh, Cytoscape rather than uh, Gephi, so another software, which gives uh, more 
um, uh, functionalities. Uh, if we want to add more information, for example, we wanted to uh, state to, to use different representational conventions for metaphors or for metonymies or for synchrony or for the diachrony. Okay, so uh, Sidescape gives this opportunity. So this is a mixed multigraph of the domain of time. In a way, um, the same um, map here, this is with the weight, I think, of uh, eight, I didn't add the weight. Uh, so this is like clicks, but now visualized with a different software and uh, with directionalities uh, where possible included uh, on the map. Uh, so, and you see that there are different conventions here. I might uh, remove this. Yeah. So um, when you see the dashed line here, uh, this is uh, for metonymy, a uh, vertical slash line this is for metaphor, a solid white line, this indicates synchronic explication. This means that we don't have any diachronic data in uh, our languages. Um, gray indicates uh, diachronic explication. Okay? And by the way, this uh, compares to uh, what Alex terms dialectification, which uh, means something else. I will have the chance uh, to uh, listen to uh, the lexification in, uh, at the conference uh, in one month. Um, so when you have a tested connection, we used delta-shaped arrow, like this one. And when we have reconstructed connection, we used diamond-shaped arrow. And uh, we also make a distinction between loose diachronical explication and strict diachronical explication. And in this case, we use low transparency uh, you, see, you see, this is now low transparency, and this is uh, high transparency. Mm -hmm. High, That's low. Fun. Okay, strict diachronic execution with high transparency. We will see what we mean by this later. Um, okay. and this was done manually, right? And um, yes, maybe, maybe the, the background map. The, the background was map from Flix and, from, was from oh yeah. Uh, I mean, this was computed using the algorithm uh, by uh, Redgear and uh, uh, our adjusted algorithm with weights. And now the initial graph is without uh, the differences in the edges. So you have you only have uh, the whites. Okay. Then we manipulated the edges manually. Uh, depending on the type of information we wanted to visualize. Mm -hmm. So yeah, this was done uh, uh, manually. Um, let's now see some uh, patterns that are interesting maybe. That illustrates some uh, of our points. Um, take um, the, the pair summer harvest. Um, the association is based on autonomy. Um, a particular period linked to a salient activity associated with the period. That's uh, what connects the two uh, meanings. So you see here, metonymy, we have dust line, diachronic, gray, a test connection, uh, delta shaped arrow, and it, this is strict diachronic classification. Um, this means that at one diachronic stage, for example, Homer, we find uh, one sense, uh, summer, and at a later diachronic stage, um, Classical Greek, for example, we find harvest. Okay, so one form has two different meanings, but at different diachronic stages, and this is what we mean by a strict diachronic uh, classification. Uh, again, resorting to uh, the, the distinction made by Alex von Schwab in his 2008 paper uh, between strict classification and loose uh, classification. So here are some examples from ancient Greek. The first one. Uh, is for the meaning summer. Uh, the, the form is uh, uh, teros. After it in Thesi, teros thaluia topore. But when summer comes, you reach autumn. It's a textbook use of the word teros in Homer uh, Greek. And then uh, in classical Greek, you see in Aristophanes, Taita um, Ner, Edoxen, Pena Talotrion, Amon Teros. Has only made himself himself a name by reaping another's harvest. So that's a diachronic uh, classification. We see the same pattern in ancient Egyptian, uh, old kingdom. Uh, the form for summer. Uh, I don't know how to uh, 
I don't know how to pronounce that. So this is my not expertise. So uh, but we have again the same pattern. Um, and note that also that in uh, old uh, old kingdom Egyptian, another lemma is used for uh, harvest. Yeah, this is another criterion that we we use. Um, so because one might say, all right, in Homeric Greek, you don't find uh, the word, maybe the concept itself does not exist, right? Um, you don't find harvest, maybe uh, a word for harvest, maybe there is no such concept or whatever. And uh, so we, uh, one of the criteria was to uh, search for other forms that me maybe mean this, uh, express this meaning. So in both Homeric Greek and in Old Kingdom, there is another um, next scene that means harvest, but not uh, some. Okay. Um, so now another collectification and iconic collectification is between springtime and youth. Uh, this is based on a this is based on a structural metaphor of Greek mythology. So uh, the connection of spring to youth, and uh, this is metaphorical. Let's see the examples. Um, now, in five, this is from Homer, Osate, Tula, Kai, Anthea, Lignatai, Ore, as are the leaves and the flowers in their season. So, this, this means uh, season here. Note that uh, Ore uh, in uh, Homer would also mean spring, winter, and summer, but uh, always in a specific uh, context, in a specific construction, together with. Uh, uh, a related mm -hmm. uh, meaning, like uh, for airs, hori is spring season, hori himeri is a uh, uh, wintry season, and so on. Um, and um, in the classical Greek, now this is from uh, Skinners, uh, we find uh, the word hora expressing the meaning youth. Uh, you see, an here, tale, uh, pi. Hora, the the no goddess, okay. so uh, they differ in beauty and in youth. All right, um, this has nothing to do with the season. So we have the extension from season uh, to youth. We believe that this is from the springtime to youth, um, because al although uh, even in classical Greek. Uh, we always find uh, a hora in the meaning of uh, uh, spring together in special uh, uh, constructions. And we assume that this has been conventionalized as a, a, a sense. So we can assume that there is a change from a season to springtime and then uh, to, uh, to youth. There are several examples that showcase uh, this. So we you also have uh, like hora and Kelidon, okay. um, so uh, swallow, swallow um, is a uh, Kelidon. Um, swallow bird. Yeah, yeah. swallow bird, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but other examples that show that uh, this sense of spring uh, has been conventionalized. So we assume that the extension is from spring to. Uh, Speaking of conventionalization, uh, yes. um, you did, you haven't mentioned the, uh, maybe that's implicit that when you have what you call diachronic collectification, so the, sort of a semantic shift mm -hmm. from A to B, uh, the understanding and uh, probably common sense is that there was at some point uh, um, a moment of collectification. So in order from that's usually the view mm -hmm. that in order to go from sense A to B yep. historically you go through a stage of mm -hmm. the word meaning A or B mm -hmm. for a few generations maybe and mm -hmm. then going to ending up meaning B. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So, so uh, yeah, I mean by conversion, I don't mean this. Yeah. Okay. I don't mean this. So in most of the cases uh, we're dealing with uh, uh, instances of like A and the chronic stage one. And A and B are the current stage uh, two. That's already so a change. A change, but it's, um, it's not a lot. You don't uh, uh, lose uh, meaning A. Yes. So in most of the cases. So by commercialization, is uh, we mean something else. So it's, this is um, now in line with uh, cognitive linguistic studies. So it, uh, is this sense context dependent or independent of the context? So that's. Uh, 
uh, what we mean by conventionalization. For example, I will yeah, skip this. Yeah, another concept is semantic bridge. So there's, there's yes, some context yes, yeah. where you understand, like... Uh, I'm going to, going to the restaurant, uh, no. I'm going to eat. Yeah. Uh, so it's a future meaning or a spatial meaning. So that's One, something example. in between. Yeah, so that's a, a bridging context. So when no, you it was the season, it was the it was the time of harvest or something uh -huh. like that. It's sort of a, a, a sentence which would be compatible with a, maybe with a translation harvest or summer. Maybe I mean because it, uh, whereas you had a, a, an example which was he was reaping someone else's harvest, mm -hmm. where it was clearly not this, yes, this exactly. defining. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, uh, describing the time, so it mm -hmm. was a clear case where it could only mean harvest and not summer harvest. Exactly. But there are some, maybe in texts, when you analyze text, some sentences where it's ambiguous because it's yes. precisely the bridging context between, you know, two if things. That, if that were the case, then we would include it in this loose diachronic explanation, meaning that you, this is still context dependent, mm -hmm. uh, whatever we mean by context mm -hmm. there, and it has not been conventionalized. So, uh, this is an example from ancient Egyptian, where the extension from sun to day is limited to a specific construction environment. So this is not conventionalized. So you have uh, the lex imra, which means sun, and, and when used with the quantifier now in the terminal expression arana, then it means um, uh, day. So every sun means every day. So we will not consider this as a conventionalized meaning. Mm -hmm. We will not say that um, Ra also means day, mm -hmm. but only in a specific context. So that's what, that's what we term as a loose diachronic explanation. Yeah. Do you represent it in your diachronic map? Yes, okay. as uh, with a low transparency. Ah, okay. yes. Yeah. Okay. So I, I, I skipped the one example, but that's not, that's not very important. Uh, I can move to the second case study because uh, I think I don't have much time. <laughs> so how much time do I have? Another 20 minutes. Right? 30? Okay, so I do have time. Right. Are there any questions uh, from the Zoom audience? Or maybe? I, there are some... I don't think so. Yeah. Feel free to ask questions online or in the room. Okay. Um, so the second uh, case study. Um, now I will. Um, I would like to uh, report on some of the findings uh, that we uh, had uh, in our paper on the universal microbial patterns at Mexico, uh, with a special focus on perception cognition domain. This was published in Linguistic Typology. And this is a joint work, work again, together with Ethan Grossman, Dmitry Nikolaev, and uh, Stefan uh, Police. Um, so again, we are we're talking about maps, um, weighted maps. Now, how can we use uh, these tools, not only these, in order to obtain information about uh, maybe macro area patterns and so on. So this is the outline of this second case study, uh, introduction to right. Um, why did we pick uh, these specific uh, semantic domains? And then I will focus on uh, universal patterns and then uh, on macro area patterns. Um, a reminder, what we mean by collectification, because we will use this uh, again and again. A given language is set to collectify to functional distinct senses, if and only if it can associate them with the same lexical form. Um, now, um, an example from this uh, particular uh, domain, uh, perception domain, uh, take the form of C in English, uh, as in, can you see the bird in that tree? This refers to this visual ability. And then I just can't see your point this refers to cognition. As you see a connection between perception and cognition here. One form collectifies two meanings, that be, uh, and these two meanings belong to different domains, perception and uh, cognition. Okay. Um, so the main objective is to investigate universal and neural structures in the lexicon as manifested by collectification, correspondence patterns in the semantic domains of perception and cognition. And the main question is, to what extent do bottom-up methods like the ones that we use, uh, using language samples of different sizes, match or challenge the results of case studies conducted by experts on individual languages? And to what extent do these methods reveal new universal or 
area specific generalization about the organization of uh, lexicons. Um, now, generalizations about the cross linguistic organization of a lexicon are not easily or straightforwardly identified. And therefore, access to large data sets is uh, needed. Uh, in the past, the availability of such data sets was rather limited, which resulted in a very low number of languages um, um, uh, that were considered in a, type, uh, type, a typical um, typological studies. And the number, I mean, low. Uh, the typical study uh, on the lexicon range from 10 to 50. Mm -hmm. There are some exceptions with studies that rely on massively parallel texts. And nowadays, uh, there is an increasing availability of resources that contain a large amount of lexical information, and this makes a large-scale technological studies on the lexicon possible. Um, we have discussed many times uh, the database clicks. Uh, there is also uh, the database of the automatic similarity adjustment program. Uh, there's also now uh, the Lexibank, so many uh, tools. As for the first two, clicks and uh, the ASJP, uh, um, these have been used recently uh, in order to investigate aerial factors in expert typology. So there are some studies that have already done that. Um, we will use, we use data from two different data sets. So Vanoff's uh, study of verbs of perception cognition, that's a 2008 uh, study, and clicks. Again, we used the, the second version because at that point, uh, it, this was not um, available. The third one was not available. And uh, we also employed different exploratory strategies like semantic maps, classification networks, correlation plots, and dimensionality reduction techniques. techniques. Uh, today, I will focus only on semantic maps and correlation plots. So why did we pick these domains? First of all, both domains are central to human experience. Um, as you may read this from my in the talk. Every language has a way of talking about seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, and touching, and every language has a way of speaking about how one knows. Um, also, meanings belong to, to both domains up here in the main collections of basic concepts, like in, in the shortest list. And the relevant literature reports on within domain meaning extensions, okay, like from C to here, between domain semantic connections, like from C to no, and both universal and cultural specific patterns. So there, there are some studies that we can use um, as a, um, a background or backdrop against which we will assess the validity of our uh, findings. Uh, our starting point uh, is concepts uh, cited here, so the domains cited hearing. Um, why? Because these are um, universally more prominent uh, than the other sensory modalities, like smell, taste, and touch. And these two, sight and hearing, these two modalities, uh, are closely, more closely connected to mental perception uh, than smell, again, taste, and touch. So mental perception like knowing, understanding, things like that. And, uh, uh, here we also make a distinction between control activities and non-control uh, experiences that uh, has been made in the relevant literature. Um, uh, the textbook example of a control activity of a verb expressing a control activity is a look. Non-control experience, uh, C is one of the verbs that express such a, a non-control experience. I have the experience of the event. I look at something, I see something I don't have. Uh, the control of the experience. Um, now, as for semantic extension, there is um, a distinction between intrafield or interdomain um, extensions and interfield field or interdomain. So within the domain and across domains, so that's the difference. Um, so uh, we, as for the intradomain extensions, uh, this is again a very a famous, a very popular hierarchy proposed by Viberg, who suggests that uh, sight um, is more prominent than hearing, which is more prominent than touch, smell, and then smell and taste are less prominent than touch. Um, and this has to do with uh, uh, 
um, marketness. So, um, or I mean, if you take a verb, uh, uh, how one can reach this hierarchy. So, a verb which prototypically has a side meaning, so meaning C, uh, will then extend to um, a, a meanings like here, meanings like that, and not vice versa. So, not not uh, there won't be a verb meaning here. Uh, which will extend to the mean uh, um, C. Um, so uh, this is based on uh, several marketing criteria like structural coding. Uh, take this example from uh, the language Jaru, uh, where the form for site is um, less coded than uh, the form for hearing. You see that the form for hearing is based on the form of for site with the additional um, uh, affix that's to, to, to it. Mm -hmm. So this is an, an indication. This is uh, what we mean by marketness and uh, as regards uh, coding. Um, now that hierarchy could be used for many hypotheses, not just the direction mm -hmm. or I mean, could be about the directionality mm -hmm. or like a verb, a word meaning sight and uh, like to see. Mm -hmm. Can it go to? Can it extend to here? Yes. That should be one hypothesis. Mm -hmm. But it could be many other things, like morphology uh, yeah. complexity or morphological complexity. Yes, it could also be that um, uh, even uh, what is this here? A textual frequency that mm -hmm. verbs meaning C will be more frequent in a text than mm -hmm. verbs meaning here. Okay. Uh, again, these are uh, hypotheses. I mean. Yeah, and, uh, that could be counterexample. Of course, we could find a word which meant here, which and you know in some language. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I mean, uh, I mean these are, these are based on uh, tendencies, right? Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, so some studies have confirmed. Some other studies have confirmed this priority of uh, the visual modality, uh, but uh, um, uh, they think that the ranking of the other modalities varies. So that's the only difference. So they, they would. Uh, Put uh, smell, taste, and touch maybe together. Yeah. Or, so okay, that one thing I wanted to say, actually, yeah. we, it, let's imagine this uh, hierarchy is, you know, correct or verified in many cases. We could, I don't know exactly how we, uh, okay, and it could be relevant to the directionality of semantic change, but it, I, I could imagine it going both ways. Like with um, hypothesis one is if you have a word meaning smell or taste, it, it would extend to to touch and then to hear and then to sight, but not the other way around. Okay, mm -hmm. or hypothesis B, uh, exactly the opposite. Or not. I, I in this case, I have no intuition. I should. Yeah, I mean, another way to read it, I think, is that if uh, a word means uh, sight and touch, it should also mean hearing. So, yeah, I think yeah. that. Exactly that. I mean. All sort of uh, implications there. Uh, for, uh, for instance, in English, we have see and feel. Mm -hmm. uh, see, hear, and feel. So feel can, can, can go with, I don't know, uh, sentire. You know, sentire in, in uh, Romance languages can be, usually go with, can go with taste and smell mm -hmm. and touch, like you sentire with your hands, mm -hmm. um, but never with sight. And then hearing is sort of gray zone mm -hmm. because Catalan and Italian use sentire or sentire, okay, to mean hear. So there's the there was this extension from from feel to to hear, but never but 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 not to sight. So mm -hmm. among Romance languages, none of them can mean to see. Mm -hmm. uh, sentire the, the, the root sentire cannot mean to see, but it can mean hear in some languages. Yeah. yeah. So it this would be another, also, yeah. another application of that. Mm -hmm. right. And this considers another meaning, so a more general feel mm -hmm. uh, meaning, which is not there mm -hmm. uh, in a way. Yes. Yeah. I, I, I mean, yeah, there, there is a question. I was wondering, is it so you, you call it that cognition or perceptual cognition? Mm -hmm. Is it because of cognition or is it because of the world we live in? Because I, I feel like, especially for touch, uh, maybe it doesn't make sense in, in like uh, like things where you don't have shops or you don't have music, but now with, with all these shops and music, it's very perfect actually to have like warning signs like uh, here or we touch with the eye or something like that and say, well, keep your hands in your pocket, mm -hmm. but you know, um, mm -hmm. and so maybe at some point touching could become something that's 
that you can use your factors. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Why not? And so your point in your in this slide mm -hmm. was about this hierarchy and saying mm -hmm. what that, that um, the um, visual modality. I mean, yes, the visual modality um, prevails in a way over all the other modalities. Okay. So, um, in general, sight and hearing are predominant, and uh, that's why we picked these two. Okay, so that's our uh, first criterion, right? Um, okay, so now moving on to the inter uh, field or inter domain extensions. Uh, here, um, I have this study by Schwitzer in her book from Etymology Pragmatics, uh, who discusses the mind as body metaphor. Um, uh, according to which the internal self is understood in terms of the bodily external uh, self. And uh, Schwitzer uh, would argue that um, uh, this, is, this is very common cosmically, this metaphor is very common cosmically, if not universal. Uh, and, and she means the connection between vision and knowledge. And she discusses these two metaphors seen is knowing and here is understanding. And what is interesting is that uh, what she states here, she um, states that it would be a novelty for a verb meaning here to develop a usage meaning no, rather than understand, whereas such a usage is common for verbs meaning see. Meaning see. Um, and uh, then Evans and Wilkins in their 2000 uh, study uh, found counter evidence to this idea. Um, they found that uh, the, the cognitive verbs, the main source for cognitive verbs, uh, are is the uh, the, the here uh, concept, okay? and um, given these results, we can assume that there is a, a more general metaphor: cognition is perception rather than uh, cognition is uh, seeing, and uh, which can be filtered uh, through the sieve of culture, okay? and then this this kind of gives us three. Sub metaphors like cognition is seeing in English, cognition is smelling in Jahai, and cognition is hearing in Wanwara. Okay. Um, all right. So let's now see uh, what we have to say about uh, associations in the domains of perception, cognition, and regarding the universal patterns. So as, as I said, uh, the first data set we used is from Vanov. Uh, she uses uh, a sample of 25 languages, mostly African. And um, one of the results that she reports is that it concerns transfield connections. And she says that the auditory modality prevails uh, over the visual modality uh, in that there are, there are stronger semantic association of hearing and mental uh, perception rather than um, seeing and mental perception. Um, now, what we did is that we took her the data that uh, Vanoff has in her, her paper, and uh, we transformed uh, transformed the data into the lexical metrics that you see here. And you can you can imagine why: are the languages, the forms, the meanings. Mm -hmm. One and zeros. A form has a meaning. Zero does not have a meaning. Mm -hmm. And then we produced a map uh, based on this uh, data set. So now you, you can see here uh, the result visualized. So this is a, a semantic map of the associations between the verbs of seeing, hearing, and cognition verbs in the Vanoff data set, right? And um, all the patterns that one can detect, if, I, if, uh, if we look in search for patterns in this table, we might find a pattern, right? I mean, we will identify in the end. But now they are directly visible. Okay. And we can see that the auditory modality prevails over the visual modality when it comes to the association with the cognition verb. So you take uh, here and see, okay. and take the um, uh, edge between here and now. And now we look at, uh, at the width of the edge. Here and now, no. here and understand, and compare this to understand, see, and know and see. Now this is pretty evident. Now that um, there is a stronger connection between hear and understand and hear and know than see, know and see and understand. So this is directly uh, visible. And we also take some other, um, uh, we can make some predictions. 
that if a form means see and think, it should definitely mean no as well, right? Or if we don't want if we don't want to go this way, it could also mean understand and hear. They can go the other way. So we can make certain predictions and we can have a look at the data and see whether this is true and so on. Does this graph mean that learn or you see more than you hear or, or, or it's not? Uh, yes. And we can see that from the communities detected uh, again automatically by the modularity analysis. We have two uh, communities and uh, these communities uh, suggest that uh, think, know, see and learn okay, go together and hear, obey, heed, understand, and remember, also go together. Again, um, this is just the machine, right? We do not have to follow the machine, <laughs> uh, but this is indicative, uh, especially in cases like this, where we have only a, a very small set of uh, meanings, maybe uh, community detection is not very helpful. Community detection is uh, particularly interesting and helpful when you have um, um, big data, and you want to make sense uh, of the, the, the big data, right? So now, I mean, it's not that, uh, this is not that helpful. Um, all right, so that was the first uh, set. Now, second, uh, clicks. Again, I'm not gonna repeat uh, the details about clicks. Um, so again, this is uh, uh, how one collects the data from clicks. Uh, they come in the uh, CSV format. Um, so, all the meanings that are tested for Lex seems that express at least one of the four concepts. See, look, hear, and listen. This is our starting point. See, look, hear, and listen. We have 4,000 different word forms. 800 word forms correct five these two meanings, okay? Um, and the forms could express 362 meanings in total. Okay. So, so, you see here um, the language in red, the form, all these forms in blue here, first cell, co-express C and no. All these forms in blue in the second uh, cell here, co-express C and find and so on. And again, as before, um, as previously mentioned, we perverted uh, this table to a lexical matrix of this type. And, and uh, we run the algorithm um, so this is again our uh, input. Okay? We use the adjusted algorithm, which takes into account the frequency of the station, and which also takes into account the economy principle. I'm not going to repeat the, this. If you have a question say, about the economy principle, we can get back to this later on. And that's uh, the result. All right. I, again, um, the point of departure. The point of departure is. Uh, the meanings see, look, hear, and listen, right? So we see different meanings that are associated with all, all these four uh, meanings. And so if you see that look has these meanings, see has all these meanings, hear all these meanings, and so on. And uh, this map respects the economy principle that I showed you before. Um, what we can infer from this is that cognition senses. Still from the, 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 the no, no, now this is from clicks. Okay. This is from um, clicks. Uh, cognition senses, like uh, know something and understand, mediate between the domains of vision and hearing. Okay? Mostly, except, I mean, there, there is an exception here with uh, two languages um, expressing hear and see without the need to express no uh, uh, or understand it well. But they, there are two or three languages, I think, and they belong to- here, Yes, and without uh, no, without understand. Okay. And uh, they come from uh, the same language family, and so there might be also an aerial uh, okay. thing. Okay. I don't remember which language, by the way. Um, so now, non cultural experiences, like as uh, seen here, are linked directly to cognition. So here, directly to understand, see directly to understand, you know, and um, while control activities like look okay, and listen are not. So in order for look to mean understand, it should necessarily mean see as well. Yeah. Same with no. So um, only non-cultural experiences have a direct link to uh, cognition. Yeah. 
the, does it mean that un understand is a non control activity yeah. in England? That linguistic, that language, languages tend to favor the idea that understand is a non control. Yeah, yeah. As it is, uh, anyway. yeah. I, uh, I, I don't know. I mean, that's an interpretation. I mean, yeah, yeah. Just stating uh, what we see in the table. Uh, I, I don't know what uh, the uh, you know the consequence of that. But it's interesting. Mm -hmm. Obey, yeah. obey is mm -hmm. uh, you know close yeah. to hear mm -hmm. and to listen. But obey, like obey an order, like a child who is asked to do something, whether mm -hmm. they obey or not, that's a control activity. So mm -hmm. it's interesting to see that it it, it's, it has strong links to listen, mm -hmm. which is the control one. Unlike understand or no, which it goes with, which I mean, confirm. I mean, this can only have to do may only have to do with the fact that um, the concept of a non-control experience is more central. Yeah. Uh, so, it, um, which okay. is also reflected uh, in, in the map, right? So you see the centrality um, of the node here as compared to the node listen, mm. okay. Same with uh, C and look, although look is more central than listen. Mm -hmm. say, okay, so this might have to do with uh, the centrality. Okay. Um, You've published this draft already? In, yeah, yeah, yeah. In 2022. You know? 2021, 2022. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I think it's 2022. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, all right. So, yes. So you see the collectification C and no. Um, 17 times, uh, here and now 11, here and understand 43, seen and understand 6. So now both cognition meanings are more tightly associated with the here cluster, understanding now. And what do we mean by that? Again, this is uh, the result of the modularity analysis. So you see that understanding now are green in a way. So the modularity analysis uh, place them together with here. And means belong to the to other to the other sensory modalities such as feel, smell, taste, form a group with here rather than with see and look. So taste, here, here, see here, smell, right? Um, feel all these uh, cluster with uh, here. Mm -hmm. um, and now yes, I'm here. So, which is coherence with uh, the hierarchy again. Okay. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. And now, uh, this is an, another map. Now, this, the point of departure is different. It's again based on uh, this is the clicks data set. Um, this is the semantic map for the collection patterns in the domains of perception and cognition. Now, for the whole domain, this one was only for the starting point was the meanings, see, look, hear, listen, only the, the four meanings. And this now um, does not have as a starting point only these meanings, right? uh, but uh, it considers the whole um, uh, network. Um, so we have 22 standard concepts belonging to the semantic field. So if you count this, uh, you will, the amount is, the total is 22. And we extracted all the verbs that collectify at least two meanings from this set of meanings. Okay. We have 1962 collectification patterns and almost 900 unique forms. Um, now, regarding intrafield associations, senses belonging to other sensory modalities, like taste and smell, are grouped with here again. Um, and uh, feel behaves as a kind of uh, uh, Hypernym, okay, connecting uh, all, all these here, days, well, listen. Okay. Um, now, the disadvantage of using semantic maps, we have pointed this out um, during the first, I think, uh, seminar, is that it over generates possible constellations of meanings. And what does it mean? That it predicts patterns that are possible but unattested. It predicts, for example, that there should be a pattern of baby believe thing, right? Baby believe thing, uh, although uh, this should not be a, a pattern in the language of the world. Or um, it also uh, predicts very unlikely uh, patterns. Uh, I mean, um, a pattern like a meet, get, and, and find, right? For example, if that's 
uh, uh, unlikely, whatever, it predicts that it might exist. So this is a problem with semantic maps. It is solved with classification networks, but you miss other information. Again, that's not part of our discussion today. Um, you say it's a disadvantage because it doesn't use the economic principle, doesn't um, follow? Uh, it's advantage for the semantic maps is like, um, 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 yeah, it predicts too many, too many links yes. which don't exist. Exactly. Yes. Uh, is it a matter of, is it a problem of the economy principle that you described earlier? That the, it, yes. Or it's another problem? Yes, it's, it's part of the economy principle. Mm -hmm. um, now, here, uh, uh, we still have this broader view where we consider the 22 concepts uh, that uh, belong to this perception conscious domain. And now, from this data set, what is interesting is that um, here you see the number of meanings per word forms in the data set. Uh, words with two meanings are, um, I mean, almost uh, 850. Words with three meanings are approximately 100. There are fewer words with four meanings very few words with five meanings and almost none with six meanings. You see that most of uh, the word forms in clicks and have two meanings, only two meanings, which might be, mm -hmm. um, uh, which might, or one might uh, say, okay, then I will use classification networks because uh, since we have mostly two meanings here. Um, now, regarding macro area patterns in domains of perception and cognition, um, let's see first the distribution of the, in the data per macro area in these domains. And you see that uh, uh, the data are skewed towards uh, Eurasia, right? Um, now, uh, out of the 90, 90, 962 collection patterns, um, 566 appear in Eurasia, okay? Um, only uh, 98, for example, here in Africa. So, so that uh, that might be a problem if we want to make uh, claims about the universality and so on. Okay, but this is what we have, and this is uh, the data set we use in order to test uh, the assumptions made in the literature. Uh, the the uh, picture is much better in clicks uh, three. So you see here, for example, the, the, this, this is uh, the figure translated into the table. I'm not going to repeat this again. Um, now, let's see some macro areas. That's uh, uh, the African macro area. Uh, you see here the semantic map with the weight uh, two. Uh, uh, one interesting case of pattern is between here and uh, taste, which is uh, well here in taste, which is well represented. Um, all of the sensory modalities are linearly connected in this macro area. And also interesting is the fact that no and understand do not mediate between a vision um, and other sense modalities. Okay? Um, and the fact that uh, you see the disconnected nodes here means that they did not reach the threshold of two. So there are only one language, for example, that expresses no and belief or, or whatever. Uh, so the ad, uh, the edge was uh, deleted. Um, now you compare this to the, the map from Eurasia to see what happens with here and taste. Uh, now taste is disconnected in the Eurasia. Here in Africa, here and taste are connected, despite the fact that uh, the numbers are much lower in Africa. Okay. And um, now if we check um, uh, correlation uh, plots, you will see again this pattern, the fact that here, here, and taste are uh, positively correlated. So this correlation plots show the relative strength of different classification patterns. When you see a blue like this, it means that uh, these, um, uh, the two senses are positively, are strongly positively correlated here and listen are definitely um, positively uh, correlated. Uh, C and here are negatively correlated. Uh, the X here means 
that um, um, there is no correlation and the question mark that uh, there are missing data. And now let's move to South America. That's uh, the last uh, macro area I would like to discuss. And uh, you see this is the, the semantic map with weight two. Um, I would like us to focus on uh, the no here uh, pattern. And compare this to the Eurasia. So no here are not directly uh, mm -hmm. connected. Mm -hmm. uh, so now you see that semantic maps are, um, could be a tool that could help us identify uh, patterns that are area specific. If you, if you compare the different maps and you see that uh, uh, there are some differences and this might say something or say, let's have a look at it. Uh, and this might reveal interesting results. Um, now, as uh, we, we, we talk about uh, here and now collectification, so as far as this collectification is concerned, you may see the distribution here. Um, um, the black colored dots represent no attestation, attestation of the collectification pattern, and other than black colored dots like pink, yellow, blue, uh, mm -hmm. yellow, green, and so on, signal that the lens varieties show this pattern. And uh, you, you see that um, this pattern exists uh, in different language varieties in South America that belong to different language families. And you see uh, different colors indicate a different language family as well. You can add no final attribute. Okay, great. Uh, thank you. Um, now let's focus on the feel and taste and that's the last uh, pattern. Feel and taste. Uh, you see now again what happens in Eurasia. Here, taste is connected. Um, and you see the distribution once again, what happens in uh, um, South America with uh, three or four, I think there are four language varieties that have this uh, pattern. Um, we could also check the correlation plots and you can see that taste and uh, feel are positively correlated and no something and here are negatively correlated. Mm -hmm. So now you see that uh, I, the semantic map tells us that there might, there, there is something there. Um, you see an association, this is area specific, but the correlation plot tells us that uh, um, this, is, uh, this is a weak association. That's what we, we mean by this um, red here, a dot. Um, now, I don't know if you want me to skip the general discussion or uh, just three minutes. three minutes, okay. So regarding you know, the, the first case study, uh, we think that um, um, this work on uh, lexical and diachronic semantic maps uh, contributes to the field of diachronic lexical semantics and brings together research on semantic maps and new chains. It focuses on the lexical and diachrony, and that's the important thing. That's something that we need to, uh, to, uh, to see. Um, we discussed this protocol uh, what is important about this is that uh, the output, uh, the output of diachronic investigations can be assessed against the background of big typological data about synchronic mean associations. So it's not like that. I'm I'm interested in one association, summer harvest. I'm looking for uh, the word meaning uh, summer and harvest. And if there is directionality, I report this. I add an arrow, and um, my story uh, uh, ends there. So having this big synchronic map and, uh, brings an advantage to these studies. So we can have like a, a bigger picture that takes into account both synchrony and, and diachrony. So the protocol does not ignore, ignore synchrony. Um, regarding the second case study, um, the semantic maps show that interfield connections between verbs of vision and hearing are mediated by interfield connections that is via the cognition domains of knowledge and understanding. Control activities as those instantiated by subverbs as look or listen, look uh, and uh, listen, where do I listen? The last on the right. Here, yeah, here, yeah. Are not directly linked to cognition. Yeah. Uh, the verbs expressing uncontrolled experience, experiences are. Yeah. 
Um, knowledge is more closely linked to vision and mental manipulation, but it's understanding to hearing, a correlation though which is stronger in Eurasia. Uh, meaning, uh, meanings belong to other sensory modalities, like taste, uh, smell, and so on, clustered with here rather than with C. And um, I'm not going to repeat the results from the macro areas. We, we saw that we can use semantic maps and correlation plots to obtain uh, important information regarding macro areas. Okay? Um, some limitations, of course, the sample is not ideal, which is skewed towards Eurasia. Uh, we talked about uh, the problems with somatic maps, and uh, even uh, techniques like uh, correlations uh, can be fooled by unbalanced samples. So uh, what we see as a result in the correlation plots might also be um, the um, result of the problematic in the data set, uh, if you think it's problematic. And uh, yeah, I mean, I will just finish with uh, what I started. I think that I managed to show that network visualizations are not just a convenient way of displaying the results, but support the in-depth diachronic and technological analysis and in an instrumental and meaningful way. And so thank you very much. Many thanks to Thanasis for this uh... Yeah, okay. I was reading, thank you, sorry for, uh, I hope you guys can hear now. Did you change? Uh, so the question is why do we need to, to organize data by geographic region rather than by language uh, um, uh, family? Um, I mean, you, you can do both, right? But um, um, I mean, what's, um, um, what do you mean by that? I mean, do you think that we will obtain different results if we do so? So by focusing on macro, I'm muted. Yes, yes, I am muted. Ah, sorry. Right. Sorry. Okay, I was muted, sorry. Um, okay, um, I, I was wondering, you're asking this question because you think that uh, uh, you would obtain different results uh, if uh, focusing on the language families rather than um, macro areas. The thing is that by focusing on uh, macro areas, uh, we are able to detect uh, some patterns that are attested in different language families. Um, whereas if we focus on language families, uh, this would be, will be like we have to repeat uh, this process many times in order to obtain uh, the same result. So, for example, in order to have this result here, um, so yeah. we, we can obtain this only by focusing on uh, yeah. uh, macro areas. Of course, you can just start uh, working on uh, a specific language family, then mm -hmm. extend your research question to another language family. But you will end up having the same result, but mm -hmm. through a different uh, route. I don't know if I can. I, I, agree, I mean, I agree with Maria mm -hmm. Carali that it could also be done by language family. Yeah, it could also, definitely. Yeah, that, that's definitely. not a problem. Yeah. And it would, pro and then depending on, in some areas, it would give us more fine-grained mm. uh, data. Uh, and as you said, like South America has several mm. language families, you know, so we would have even more fine-grained data. Yes. But, uh, uh, and Maria says, we don't know. Uh, we don't know. Areas. If there will be differences or not. Yeah, correct. So, well, it's a question. I mean, intuitively, we believe uh, that the patterns, but, but it's, it's a hypothesis that could be empirically tested, that the tendencies that you, you've shown, uh, what I think many of us believe is that they are aerial rather than phylogenetic. Mm -hmm. But of course, you know, this could be tested more. So, for instance, um, Wilkins or Evans and Wilkins mm -hmm. yeah. in 2000, which uh, in the mind's ear, that's the title of 
uh, of their paper were discussing Australian languages, um, okay, which belong to a variety of different families, and it was more an aerial pattern that uh, know, to know something is usually to hear yeah. rather than to see. And it would, you know, this, this sort of uh, polysemy, um, this sort of classification is, is typically the thing that is a, an aerial pattern. So, so uh, uh, yes, it could be tested also by a yeah. genetic family, but probably aerial is. Uh, another way to refine the data would be to go to, to be finer than continents. Because yeah. of course, when you do Africa as mm. a whole, you know Africa is not one area; it's a, it's a, a set of different areas. Yeah, yeah, of course. That's why we are talking about macro areas. Yeah, macro. Areas. And and to uh, use the the distinctions made already within clicks. I think this is uh, the distinction that they use. Uh -huh. like, different. Uh, okay. uh, if I'm not wrong, if I this uh, I have to go back to the data. Yeah. I think this is the, the distinction they are making. Yeah, so they have like one category for, yeah, so Maria says Africa has many language families mm -hmm. and, yeah, yeah, yeah. and it also has many areas. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. Great. Yeah, thank you, Great. Maria, for the question yeah. and for the comment. Um, okay. uh, question. Yeah, so uh, what so in, in your in your paper, you, did you did you have conclusions about? I mean, did you suggest conclusions about different continents having different semantic organization? Did you present it as as uh, an accident of history or uh, as potential? I, I I don't think you you didn't necessarily have to go far in the mm -hmm. Werfian, but of course, there's the reader <laughs> will have Werfian uh, perspective on this, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, like uh, culture and or language and mind and language and culture and so on. W would you go in that direction yourself or would you say at least these are the results and maybe? Um, I, I mean, one of the questions is to see whether our, our data match uh, the, uh, some of the results that we have already seen in the literature. So in some cases they match. So in some others, we were able to detect some new results um uh for example um the fact about this control activities okay that's uh, uh, what's the connection between non control uh experience and control activities and uh, cognition verbs and so on uh, so this is something that um we uh, we defined from the data that was not reported, but um, we didn't dare to make claims of the type that you suggest because uh, the, the, the data set, I mean, the sample mm -hmm. is uh, biased towards Eurasia. Uh, then mostly, uh, and if we compare the Eurasian map and the universal map, you see that in, in a way the Eurasian map Reproduces or I guess the yeah. I think I mean, I, at least you've shown that one can filter or you know the data the data set and produce different maps. Yes, and you you sort of arbitrarily chose continents uh, because maybe it was there in clicks, so mm -hmm. it was you know in um, uh, in. In uh, you had Africa and you had the Americas. I can't yeah. remember the name. Eurasia, uh, South, so South was, America. So one could one could uh, uh, criticize maybe that choice. You know why mm. Eurasia, why Africa, and why not families? That's a good point. Mm. But I think methodologically, you 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 know you could have chosen other things, but at least you show that uh, you you don't get the same semantic maps if, mm. if you don't. Uh, yeah, that's the whole point. Yeah. That's the whole point. I mean how. Um, can these visualizations uh, can uh, um, guide us in a way to, to, to tell us, okay, look, there is something interesting there. You might want to check it. And you go and see, okay, I, I identified this collectification pattern, which is unique uh, to this uh, macro area. Let's zoom in and uh, we'll see what happens. And then you, you did see that some are very area specific. Uh, mm. You see a cluster 
of uh, languages that belong to different language phenomena, uh, like to different families, yes. Um, so this, of course, in some other cases, it did not work, right? I mean, we, we see some interesting uh, collectification patterns, but uh, then the, the, the result, if you zoom in, might not be that revealing or something, right? Mm -hmm. um, but yes, uh, to return to your first uh, question, I mean, I think uh, we didn't dare to uh, make some claims due to the, the, the problems with uh, uh, the sample. And we didn't have access to the, the third version of clicks, which is a, a better balanced yeah. now and richer. Uh, maybe we can reproduce uh, some of the maps at least uh, take into account uh, the new version to see what happens, yeah. Okay. Are there any last questions, maybe, for today? Uh, yeah, but Shu has a question. Do you, want, you don't have a mic, forget it, but... Um, but uh, yeah, so it was very, like, very interesting. So... Thank you. Uh, Try and speak up because the mic... Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so uh, my question, actually, yeah, too, but... Uh, you, you say that like common semantic maps is that they uh, show or well, can show, I mean, people could infer patterns that are actually uh, in existence, right? Yeah. Like, but um, yeah. it's just assuming that everything, because like every, it's kind of like a bit bold you know, to, to assume that, I mean, uh, as soon as you have like a path, in a, in a semantic graph, you would expect it to be like realized somehow. And then, uh, mm. couldn't you? I mean, sure, it's like a bit more computation, and maybe it's not easily uh, uh, displayable on the graph, but you could use things like, uh, uh, let's say, uh, um, a random walk or things mm -hmm. like that, right? Like you take two, two, two or three elements, you know, and then you just like, uh, compute some measure of how far they are in the graph and how like easy they put you are somewhere you went up in the other place. And then you can, you know, infer like, okay, well, of course it's shown in the graph, but the truth is that it's very unlikely either because there are too much holes between, like too much, even if they are very strong uh, codification, you have like the path is just so long that it's just very unlikely, mm -hmm. or you don't have that many hopes, but it's Hopes, what do you mean? Like jumps or yeah, like edges. Uh, uh, hopes, yeah. Maybe, uh, yeah. Hopes. Uh, but but they, they are just like so, they're already so uh, um, not likely. Each each on its own is very not likely. So if you have like three in a row, it's mm -hmm. just like you're never going to see that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, when I'm talking about this, uh, the problem with uh, semantic maps. Uh, in fact, I'm um, actually citing other people. Mm -hmm. Other, 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 other yes. 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 generate uh, these uh, constellations and so on. Um, um, I'm not totally convinced. Uh, I mean, uh, for reasons that you also mentioned, uh, I'm, I'm not muted, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, I, we didn't uh, employ uh, like sophisticated network measures, as you suggested, like a random walk, we can do that. Yeah, we can definitely try and uh, employ such uh, uh, measures and that might be uh, uh, re revealing. Um, and another thing is that we have to also take into account that in most of the cases, word forms express just two meanings. Mm -hmm. So um, the, the, the point of having like more than two, maybe it's uh, redundant. Um, if I go back to this uh, table uh, that I showed you before uh, the distribution, yes. So this is the number of meanings per word form. You see that most word forms, the data set express two meanings. So uh, we can stop actually here, the four meanings, and that will be enough. Um, but even in this case, you know, um, Where's my uh, let's take this one, uh, Eurasia. Um, um, we would say that one possible constellation given this restriction, a, a one, a one a possible combination is uh, meet, see, know, learn. Uh, 
And uh, this is predicted by uh, the semantic map model. And the criticism against this is that although it is predicted that it exists, it might not exist. Um, so that's, a, a, again, a criticism. I don't buy criticism. Yeah. I just wanted to cite yeah. uh, say this one. It's, I mean, like, uh, I mean, it's the other, like, the, the physical mathematics uh, thing, right? Like, mm -hmm. the, the, the relativity predict that there could be uh, small kettles uh, flying around the sun. Like, mm -hmm. we never saw one, but, but in theory, it's possible. <laughs> Yeah. The universe will just work the same. Like, it's just like we didn't form them. Mm -hmm. so. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, okay. Thanasis, so what what will be the topic of your last uh, lecture? Uh, lecture. That's the last one. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, actually, actually uh, we, we will discuss a uh, different topic, topic. A slightly, slightly different topic. So, so not focus on on the cosmic patterns, but focus uh, on language specific language patterns. So, so uh, one of the questions will be like how one can distinguish between different senses within language. Now we talk about things like lexical constructions. And uh, with a special focus on uh, a method called uh, the be uh, behavioral profile method, which was uh, developed by uh, uh, Greece um, uh, and Divyak, or Divyak and Greece. Um, and uh, the data we'll be discussing will come from ancient Greek and modern Greek. So a, a bit of a different story there. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Christopho D. Thank you. Uh, to everyone for following this third uh, lecture today uh, in the room or uh, at the other end of the waves. So I'm saying goodbye to everyone and hope to see you next week uh, for the last session of this uh, lecture series. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you for your questions. Thank you.